Welcome to this press conference. Uh, bonjour, bienvenue à tous à cette conférence de presse. Nous sommes en compagnie de la vérificatrice générale du Canada, Karen Organ. We are joined by uh, the Auditor General of Canada, Karen Organ, uh, to talk about four audit reports that were tabled to Parliament. So she will have uh, opening uh, remarks and then we'll go to questions on uh, un journaliste dans la salle pour l'instant uh, uh, so people on zoom you can use the raise hand function to uh, notify me that you will have a question at any moment madame Morgan merci bonjour et merci de vous joindre à moi je vais d'abord souligner que nous nous trouvons à Ottawa sur le territoire traditionnel non cédé du peuple algonquin Anishinaabe Aujourd'hui, je présente quatre rapports d'audit de performance qui ont été rendus publics ce matin. Ces quatre audits abordent différents secteurs d'activité gouvernementale, mais ils sont liés par un fil conducteur. Ce fil conducteur, c'est l'inclusion. These audits are important because every person, regardless of his, her, or their health status, gender, or location, has a right to participate fully and equally in society. Consider this. It's frustrating enough to land after a flight to only find out that your luggage didn't make it. Now consider that your missing cargo is not your toothbrush or an extra change of clothes, but your wheelchair. And without it, you are unable to move around independently. Some people in Canada have to constantly fight for rights that others take for granted as basic rights. Whether access to these rights is delayed or denied, the impact is that some members of society are excluded or left behind. This is the concern that these four audits are highlighting today. So let me turn now to our findings. Our first audit focused on whether Via Rail, the Canadian Air Transport Security Authority and the Canadian Transportation Agency work to identify, remove, and prevent barriers for travelers with disabilities. In 2019 and in 2020, more than one million persons with disabilities who traveled on a federally regulated mode of transportation faced a barrier. Nous avons constaté que les trois organisations avaient identifié certains obstacles et pris des mesures pour améliorer l'accessibilité des transports. Via Rail a tenu des consultations auprès de personnes en situation de handicap au moment de concevoir sa nouvelle flotte. Via Rail a aussi tenu des consultations au sujet de son plan d'accessibilité et de ses programmes de formation, tout comme l'Administration canadienne de la Sûreté du transport aérien. En dépit de ses progrès en, ma de ses progrès en matière d'accessibilité, beaucoup d'obstacles restent. Par exemple, nous avons constaté que les sites web n'étaient pas entièrement accessibles. C'est un constat très préoccupant, car c'est un obstacle auquel se butent souvent les personnes en situation de handicap. Pour accroître encore plus l'accessibilité des trains, des avions et des autres moyens de transport visés par une réglementation fédérale, les organisations responsables doivent élargir leurs consultations, rendre le, leur contenu en ligne entièrement accessible et utiliser les données relatives aux plaintes pour identifier, comprendre et prévenir les obstacles. Notre deuxième audit visait à déterminer si Innovation Science et Développement économique Canada et le CRTC avaient amélioré l'accessibilité, le caractère abordable et la qualité de l'Internet haute vitesse et de la connectivité cellulaire mobile pour les personnes qui habitent dans les régions rurales et éloignées du Canada. At a time when so much takes place online, it is critical for all Canadians to have access to reliable and affordable high-speed Internet and mobile cellular services. This again is a matter of inclusion. When services are of poor quality, unaffordable or unavailable, people are effectively excluded from participating fully and equally in the digital economy, accessing online education, banking, medical care, and government services, or 
working remotely. We found that overall, access to internet and mobile cellular services had improved across the country since our last audit in 2018. However, internet connectivity in rural and remote areas remains below 60% and below 43% on First Nations reserves. Therefore, while connectivity has improved in urban areas, the federal government's strategy has yet to deliver results for, those, for many in rural and remote communities and First Nations reserves. We also found that there were delays in approving projects that were meant to bring services to rural and remote areas. This means that the 1.4 million households who are already underserved, First Nations reserves and people in rural and remote areas, are left waiting. Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada tracked only some dimensions of the quality and affordability of service. The department considers pricing to be part of affordability, but not household income. I find this puzzling, because if the price of a service is beyond a household's means, then connectivity will not improve, and some people will remain excluded. Nos constats font ressortir le fossé numérique persistant entre les personnes qui habitent dans les réserves des Premières Nations et les collectivités rurales et éloignées comparativement aux personnes qui résident en zone urbaine. Le gouvernement doit agir pour amener une connectivité à Internet abordable et à haute vitesse à toute la population canadienne partout au pays. Passons maintenant à notre dit de l'assistance internationale. Affaires mondiales Canada consacre en moyenne 3,5 milliards de dollars chaque année pour soutenir l'égalité des genres dans les pays à faible revenu et à revenu intermédiaire. Cependant, le ministère ne parvient pas à démontrer comment cet argent améliore la situation des femmes et des filles. We found significant weaknesses in the department's information practices. This included not having a standardized approach for storing, managing, and using project information. In addition, the department has not set itself up to track long-term outcomes. So while it is able to show, for example, that money has been spent to provide nutritious meals, it does not know whether long-term health outcomes have improved for the people who were supposed to receive those meals. These weaknesses make it impossible for Global Affairs Canada to accurately track and report on the outcomes of funded projects against the goals set out in Canada's feminist international assistance policy. These weaknesses are not new. They were flagged in a departmental internal audit in 2021. It is imperative that Global Affairs Canada immediately act to improve its information management practices and reporting on results to show parliamentarians and Canadians the value of Canada's bilateral international assistance to support women and girls in low to middle and middle income countries. Notre dernier audit a vérifié si services publics et approvisionnement Canada avaient géré efficacement les coûts, le calendrier et l'étendue des travaux effectués pendant les premières phases du programme de réhabilitation de l'édifice du Centre du Parlement. Selon une estimation faite en 2021, les travaux de réhabilitation coûteront de 4,5 milliards à 5 milliards de dollars. Ce vaste programme fait intervenir de nombreux partenaires, y compris la Chambre des communes, le Sénat, le Service de protection parlementaire et la Bibliothèque du Parlement. Nous avons conclu que Services publics et Approvisionnement Canada avaient utilisé des approches souples pour gérer efficacement les phases de planification, de conception et de début de construction du programme. Le ministère a ajusté le déroulement des travaux en fonction de décisions de planification qui ont tardé en ce qui concerne les besoins importants des utilisateurs comme le nombre et la taille des salles requises par les divers partenaires. We also found that the department consulted and worked with experts to balance environmental sustainability 
and accessibility elements while respecting the heritage nature of the building. Given the size and complexity of this undertaking, a streamlined decision-making process will be required to continue effectively managing the costs and timelines of the rehabilitation program as the construction work accelerates between now and the planned completion date of 2030-2031. Ces quatre dix donnent un aperçu des progrès et des difficultés dans des domaines spécifiques à un moment donné. La fonction publique a le devoir de servir tous les peuples du Canada, ce qui signifie qu'elle doit s'employer activement à offrir un accès aussi complet et égal que possible aux services, aux possibilités et au patrimoine national, tant en sol canadien qu'à l'étranger. Merci. Je suis maintenant prête de répondre à vos questions. OK, so we'll have um, about... Um a bit more than 30 minutes for questions. Um, so uh, a lot of journalists arrive uh, um, just uh, as the conference was starting. So please, uh, in the room, raise your hand if uh, you would like to ask a question. Okay, so first we'll go with Ian Bailey from the Golden Mail. In your uh, audit on the uh, Parliament Hill renovation, Center Block Parliament Hill renovation, you talk about the need to maintain rigorous cost management processes. Why is this important and what happens in your view if uh, they aren't maintained in this context? So up until now, the project has really been about design and site preparation. Um, so for many who have passed by the building, you'll see the, the, the big hole in front of the Parliament building. So excavation for the new Welcome Center. Uh, it's, uh, Public Service was able to sort of manage, it, manage um, the, the time it took for uh, decisions to be made. For example, we saw a decision taking almost two years to be made. Um, as they, because of where they were in the project. But now as we move into a construction project, uh, it's really important to ensure that timely decision making is there. Uh, time, you know, delays in decisions usually bring out increased costs, right? And, and it is a difficult project given all of the partners involved. So I, I could give you a great example. If you have ever renovated your kitchen, imagine if you had to um, not only get consensus of everyone that you live with, but all the neighbors on your street as well before you could pick out the cabinet tree. Uh, so it, it, that kind of decision making will take some time, so it's important to streamline that to keep costs low. Are you confident they will be able to do that based on your investigation, your office's investigation of the well, this parties is our, in this matter? This is our second audit looking at um, the rehabilitation uh, of center block. The first time we had identified that the governance structure was actually impeding timely decisions, um, and now we found that decision making still remains fragmented. Uh, so we made some other recommendations to sort of centralize it and to try and keep all the key dates on everyone's agenda. I think time will tell, but it really is up to PSPC and the partners to, to diligently continue to work down a path of keeping this on track and under budget. Okay, so uh, next we have Mike Jurek from the Canadian Press. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, so audit number four talks about aid being diverted from Africa toward Ukraine and general COVID-19 help, but your office mentioned that this trend is uh, known, but there's no clear data on the specifics. I guess, can you speak to whether this is part of a general trend of development dollars being hard to track? Well, what we found here was actually uh, that the department uh, was unable to show us how the money invested actually was improving the lives of women and girls. Um, and uh, I would chalk it up to two, two big things. Uh, the first being um, significant weaknesses in their information management systems, right from how you store data, gather it, share it, and use it for decision-making purposes. In fact, it took several months for us to gain access to the information that we had requested. Um, that just tells me that people aren't using it for day-to-day -day inf information and decision-making. Uh, the second thing I would point out is that the department hadn't set itself up to look at long-term indicators um, of progress. Uh, they had 26 indicators in their policy, but all of them sort of tracked um, activities. Uh, so for example, uh, they, we looked at a project where the government funded um, making schools more welcoming for girls and building washrooms and hand washing stations for girls in schools. While they could tell us how many washrooms had been built, they couldn't tell us whether or not girls' attendance at school was maintained or increased. So that focus on outcomes, while difficult, is really what's needed when it comes to international assistance. 
And then I guess how can the lack of tra tracking for some of these figures in this report, um, I guess, affect people's trust in government? Well, when we looked at, when we actually saw, got files, the project manager did a, a good job of monitoring the progress, ensuring that money um, went out when key milestones were, um, were achieved. What was missing was t taking a step back and looking at that global picture across the whole department. Um, senior management wasn't asking for that and tracking progress on the commitments in the international assistance policy either. Uh, so we made recommendations to improve the information management system, but also training uh, for individuals. Uh, I spoke with the deputy minister. This comes off of a 2021 audit where they knew the same issues persisted, and I talked to him about ensuring that they have something in the meantime, so in the interim, to ensure that they can show the value of Canada's investment. Next in line, we have Kemba Clark from the Globe and Mail. Hi. You gave an example of uh, nutritious meals being provided to students and whether it had an effect on health comes. Even in Canada, it would be hard to attract, I, I imagine, whether a nutritious meal led to somebody being healthier 10 years later. Is it realistic to ask that that kind of international assistance dollar lead to that kind of tracking? And what is realistic in your view? Um, so I agree with you that tracking outcomes, especially when it comes to health, um, are, is complex and difficult. And you can't uh, make the straight analogy that one nutritious meal will result in healthier outcomes. Um, but if the project is designed to, um, to do that, to improve health outcomes, then you should at least set yourself up to try and track that kind of metric. Um, you know, knowing how many meals go is a good indicator of progress, but not a good indicator of meeting the long-term goal in the policy, which is to make the lives of women and girls better. Do you think there's a lack of tracking of outcomes for international assistance as far as you have seen in your audits? Well, in this audit, I would tell you, yes, there is a lack of tracking of outcomes, but I would say that that's almost um, more broader than just international assistance. We often talk about um, having good metrics on outputs but not on outcomes um, because it's just simpler. And I really believe that, that you need both. You need those outputs in order to show progress in the short to medium term, but you need the outcome indicators that you have to start tracking on day one in order to show the long-term benefit and the true value of the investment made by the government. Okay, so I just want to last check if uh, there's someone in... Yep, okay, so Fraser Needham from APTM. Go ahead. In terms of internet connectivity and First Nations, um, you noted that uh, they look at price but not at affordability or the uh, income of the community. Did you find that was the case where there is actually the service available in First Nations but maybe the majority of people weren't getting uh, the service because they couldn't afford it? Um, so there's, um, you're talking again about great data gathering, um, which is, is something that is needed to be improved when it comes to connectivity. Um, what we found was that the, the government would track when access was available, so they could tell you, um, you know, that they brought the, the infrastructure to a rural and remote community or to a First Nations, but they weren't really tracking uptake. And so many of our recommendations are linked to um, tracking not just whether you get the access there, but whether uptake is happening. Uh, when it comes to affordability, I would tell you that in my view, the government's missing half the story. They're really tracking uh, the price of service when they measure affordability, but really not making a link or a relation to a household's income. And so while we c could get as a country that uh, internet connection up to rural and remote communities and First Nations reserves, if someone does, can't afford the service, it's like not having the service at all. And so they need to, I think, look at both um, income and uh, pricing, as well as actual take-up rates once um, access is expanded across the country. Okay, and just uh, as a follow-up, I know, um, I think you said 40% in this fiscal year has been spent of what's been budgeted for um, internet connectivity. Um, is that, were you noticing that they're not spending all the money available in a fiscal year on, on this, or they're too, the government's been too slow to uh, make this a priority and spend the funds, or, or are they spending what what they need to or what they've uh, budgeted each year um, so no they're not spending what they plan for each year that 2.4 billion dollars was available up until january of 2023 to be spent and only 40 percent had been spent at that time 
Um, it, it is really, in my view, because of um, Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada and CRTC's slowness in approving projects. Uh, so, for example, um, I think it's I said had under the Universal Broadband Fund um, took about a year to approve some projects when the, they had communicated that it would take five five weeks. Uh, we also saw a similar delay with the CRTC, where it took them about two years to approve a project instead of the 10 months that they had anticipated. So that delay in getting funding out um, either causes a delay and people continue to wait, or even some service providers had told us that they abandoned projects because of the delay in waiting for funding. So I think that that would help contribute to increased access if they could get the money out quicker. Okay, so now we'll go on the Zoom. So I have a um, few journalists who have raised their hands. So first, we'll go with David Aiken, Global. Uh, good afternoon, Auditor General. Thanks for taking our questions. Uh, just a bit of a broader question. Some of your audit work here, and I think in previous audits, is looking at uh, government activities that took place during the pandemic. And I'm certain any of my colleagues uh, who do any access to information work can tell you that uh, we saw significant delays and slowdowns when we would ask for government records um, that about activity during the pandemic. So with that in mind, I wonder if you could just, uh, I think this goes to your global affairs chapter, but I wonder if you could speak broadly as to um, how did, in your opinion, government transparency and accountability work through the pandemic uh, periods that we've been through in much of the last two years? Well, I've completed many audits uh, throughout the pandemic, and uh, we always worked well in collaboration with departments and agencies to receive uh, the information that we needed. It definitely took longer, but I do believe that that was understandable given um, everything that public servants were doing. But when it came to the international assistance audit and global affairs, um, we, we had asked for much information and they had told us that it could not be found, um, that it was perhaps on an individual's laptop who had since left the government and that they, because they didn't have a central repository, they couldn't locate the information. Um, as we pushed harder, it took several, several months. Uh, the deputy minister was involved. Uh, the information um, was located in different places in different forms. So it just speaks there, I think, to um, a, a, a mismanagement of information, not necessarily an intentional lack of transparency. In fact, um, I, we usually have very good cooperation, um, and once the information was found, they were able to answer all of our questions. So it was really a matter of not having the information readily available to support good informed decision making. Okay, great. And so just to confirm, and this is the only follow-up then, that um, really can't look to the pandemic as an excuse for any information management issues at Global Affairs Canada? Um, uh, no, I don't think we should say that about anywhere across the federal government. Um, I do think that uh, even in the times of pandemic when everyone's working hard, the government um, needs to still be transparent and demonstrate due diligence when it spends taxpayers' money. Okay, so next we have uh, Palak Mangat from Parliament Today. Hi, Ms. Hogan, thanks for taking our questions. I just wanted to jump back to the, the Parliament Hill report. Um, your report highlighted governance issues around the, the, uh, the decision-making process. In your eyes, what's at stake in the short term if PSP doesn't, I believe the word that you used was centralize the decision-making process? Um, I know that you mentioned long-term cost leading up to that, that 2030 date, but until then, what could change? Um, so I, I hope that I didn't say centralized. I think it needs to be better coordinated and streamlined um, in order to ensure that decision making um, happens in a more timely fashion. Uh, so for example, we, we looked at a decision about the use of the East Courtyard that took almost two years. Um, some decisions around how many floors uh, in the uh, new Welcome Center took several years such that, they, that uh, PSPC started to dig um, as they waited for a decision to be made. Um, that kind of delay in decision making when you're in the real heavy lifting of what I would call a construction project is, will just cause further delays which could result in increased costs. 
um, while you know some change orders are needed, um, you know, a more streamlined process where people get together more regularly and have a uh, a more global picture of of what decisions are needed in a timely way will hopefully keep the project on track. And just sorry, just as a follow up, um, you know, this is an issue that you got that the AG flagged back in 2010, I think. Um, what do you make of, I guess, the hesitation to? Uh, not centralized, I guess, uh, the way that you use was coordinate. What do you make of the hesitation to, to coordinate the decision-making process here? Well, in our first audit, we actually talked about the governance structure and made some recommendations. And I know that uh, Public Service and Procurement Canada worked hard to try and implement them, but ultimately it didn't happen. And so we worked now uh, with them to try and find solutions that uh, would work within the governance structure that they've established over the last few years. Um, there are some working groups that, that speak a little bit more, um, but right now what we're really seeing is decisions sort of happening in silos um, in, instead of being more coordinated. And so we've made a recommendation to provide at least twice a year reports to both the Speaker in the House and the Senate so that one focal point at least is aware of the key decisions that are needed and will hopefully ensure that they are, are taken in a more timely way. Okay, so I don't see any more raised hands. So um, if you're on the Zoom and you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Um, and for people in the room, if you have an additional question, please uh, make a sign. So I'll just wait a few minutes. Okay, so we'll go in the room. So uh, we'll go back to Fraser Needham from APTN. Um, just a technical question, like I noticed that you um, monitored minimum level of connectivity. Is that, is that, is that, do you, um, does that meet like a high speed internet uh, level or is that just minimum connectivity? Uh, so we looked at what the government has set out in the connectivity strategy as its goal. Um, so. I'll try and give you a technical answer, but I'm going to I'm going to glance down for the words. So the goal is to have uh, 50 10, which is uh, 50 megabytes per second of upload and, and 10 um, or I said of download, I guess, and 10 for upload. Uh, we made a recommendation to ensure that that um, that speed, which is currently defined as high speed Internet, would still be considered high speed in 2030 when the goal of the government is to have 100% of Canadians connected. Uh, you know, every decade, if you look every decade or so, high speed internet becomes faster and faster. Uh, what the department told us is that many of the projects they're funding now are supposed to be scalable. Uh, so I guess time will tell whether 2030, 5010 is still high speed um, and, and if um, all Canadians can, can have access to that. Um, you didn't have a follow-up, I think. No. Okay. So, uh, Mickey Durek, the Canadian Press. Thanks. Um, this is in regards to um, the unspent dollars for the internet access projects. Is it kind of, you know, use it or lose it, or were the, will those dollars be available um, for a future budget? Do we know? Um, that's a, a technical question to really ask the government, uh, but um, up until um, January of 2023, when we stopped looking at funding agreements, um, only only 40 percent had been spent. Uh, some of that money does, I know, roll forward, but I don't know to what extent all of it does. So I do think it's a great question to them. Uh, but the slower they are at rolling out approvals of projects, the longer um, individuals in rural, remote communities and First Nations reserves are waiting. Um, and and that would have a real that has a real impact on the day to day life of everyone in those communities. And then, um, as a as another follow up, thank you. So we don't know how much money then was diverted. Um, this is in relation to uh, report number four. We don't know how much money was diverted to Ukraine that was uh, initially earmarked for Africa. Um, I don't have those statistics. That would absolutely be a question to ask uh, Global Affairs Canada. Okay, so I don't see any more um, questions or people wanting to talk, so um, I'll just uh, double check in the Zoom. Okay, we don't have any questions anymore, so thanks for your time. Have a good day. Thank you.